Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm from Singapore, uh, the Sing Health Lung Center, uh, and you can come and visit us or you can follow us on Facebook. And as what we usually do, all the slides of my lecture are already uploaded onto Facebook. So uh, it's Sing Health Lung Center if you want any of the slides. Right, so my talk is going to be about spontaneous pneumothorax. I'm not going to cover uh, iatrogenic or traumatic pneumothoraces. Uh, and let's start with a case. This is a patient of mine. As you can see, she's 32 years old, uh, not a very heavy smoker, presenting with uh, intermittent symptoms, and these are her physiological variables. I don't know whether you can see the abnormality on the chest X-ray but our radiologists have kindly given us the arrow sign, right? They've marked out the right pneumothorax and the small right pleural effusion. So the question I'm going to ask is, what is our next course of action? Should we retake the history? Should we do a CT scan? Should we insert a chest drain or refer to the thoracic surgeon? probably can't uh, get a poll here, so I believe this is a rhetorical question, and um, I'll go through some of the data. So as I was preparing for this, I just got a, a message on my phone that a new study has emerged in the New England Journal of Medicine, so this is the latest issue, uh, which is great for our field that, you know, we're constantly changing and moving. Um, this is a study from Australia that compared uh, that looked at patients with primary spontaneous pneumothorax. It compared conservative management, which means just observation, with uh, some form of pleural intervention, uh, which was drainage with a chest drain. Um, and if you can look at, okay, does it ask? Okay. So if you look at table one, right, um, this study shows us, us a lot of things that we intuitively knew about primary spontaneous pneumothorax, right? Uh, these are young patients. There is a male bias. Uh, there is a disproportionate representation of smokers. And if you see, despite the size of pneumothorax, right, if you look at the physiological variables out there, these patients were relatively well. Right? Yeah, the heart rate was 70-something. The blood pressure was in the normal range. There was no desaturation. And even in terms of symptoms, right, the symptom scores were relatively low. And these symptoms look like they can be managed with simple analgesia as opposed to some form of invasive procedure. And in this study, uh, they used this, thing, uh, this Collins method to measure the size of the pneumothorax, okay? Um, it's a very good way, I guess, for, to standardize the size of pneumothorax uh, in, in trials. But in clinical practice, um, actually, I don't really care very much about the size of the pneumothorax. It is the symptoms and the physiological status of the patient that's far more important. And when I look at the x-ray, the questions I ask is, A, the, the diagnosis confirmed, uh, and if it is not confirmed on an upright film, my go-to procedure is usually a lateral decubitus film. Of course, you can use ultrasound, uh, but uh, you know, if it's available, lateral decubitus I find much better than expiratory films or anything else. And then the next question I ask is, can I safely put a needle into the space, right? And that's why I, I'm most interested in the separation between the parietal and the visceral pleura. And if there's any suspicion of secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, then a CT is indicated. So back to our patient, well, um, clearly we don't want to rush into any intervention, especially in a relatively well patient. Um, and the question is, she is a female, right, and not a strong smoking history. So this is not a typical case, and we should think a little bit more about the history. And, you know, if you had to ask one question in the history, it would be the date of her last menstrual period, right? Because uh, patients can get catamineal pneumothoraces even without an established history of uh, endometriosis, right? The other diagnosis that is, uh, that sometimes you get in this group of patients is lymphangioleomimotosis, right? LAM. Um, 
So don't forget the history. So how will we treat the patient now, right? Um, should we give her supplemental oxygen? Should we aspirate the air out, insert a chest strain, or refer to the thoracic surgeon? And so since we've got the new study, I might as well refer to it, right? So this study, conservative management versus pleural drainage. Now in the group that had conservative management, they found that based on clinical indications, about 15% of the patients needed some form of drainage. So you can turn that around and say, well, this shows that 85% of first episode of primary spontaneous pneumothorax did not need any form of drainage at all. Right? And then if you look at the primary endpoint was radiological resolution at eight weeks. And as you can see, between conservative management and drainage, there was uh, the non-inferiority uh, standard was met. Symptom resolution, there was no difference. Interestingly, in the conservative management group, the recurrence rate was less. Uh, there are a number of hypotheses that the authors put out to try and explain this, uh, but they were all hypo uh, uh, hypothetical. Um, and then, of course, it's also worth pointing out that in those patients who did have drainage, about 50% of them needed the drain to be in place for at least three days. Not surprisingly, the patients who had drainage had a much longer length of hospitalization. They had longer days off from work. And all the, and I won't say all, the majority of the adverse events that were experienced in the drainage group were related to the insertion of the chest drain. So now, at least now, we've got more uh, evidence for some of the management principles. Uh, first is that the presence of air in the pleural space in itself is not an indication for drainage. Okay? People get excited that there's that's a pneumothorax, but you don't have to do anything that's just because it's there. Management is determined by the clinical symptoms and physiological status of the patient, not the size of the pneumothorax. Right? Um, and then even complete collapse of the lung can be treated by either simple aspiration or small box tubes. Tension pneumothorax rarely develops in primary spontaneous pneumothorax. And as you can see, if from, even from this big multi-center study, the patients who had large pneumothoraces were actually relatively well. Right? And then if drainage is required, you should consider simple aspiration. And to that, I'll show you this study which we did, or this, uh, this systematic review which we did now 15 years ago, where we're trying to address the debate between the BTS and the ACCP on whether or not we should do simple aspiration for first episode of primary spontaneous pneumothorax or we should put in a chest tube. And I think that uh, although simple aspiration obviously is far less invasive, there are some limitations, right? Uh, Obviously, if the air leak is ongoing, you're going to have to do repeat procedures, uh, and in that, some, sometimes it fails. This question you know, still keeps, go, uh, com keeps coming back to us because as uh, recently as, you can't see this, 2017, uh, this randomized control study was also uh, done. Uh, and again, it shows very much the same, same issues. You, know, you can uh, treat uh, primary spontaneous pneumothorax with uh, simple aspiration uh, quite successfully. But what, what was great about this study is that they extended this treatment paradigm to secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, right? So you can also treat secondary spontaneous pneumothorax with simple aspiration, but the caveat is you need to monitor these patients and follow them up very carefully because their physiological reserve is a lot less. And then this is another paper that came out of uh, my center, um, where, which is essentially what was the uh, intervention that was used in the recent New England Journal paper, right? You try and put in a very small catheter into the pleural space. They use a 12 French in the New England Journal paper. You aspirate the, the, the air out, and then you, uh, you, you either clamp it or you, 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 uh, you spigot it. Uh, and then you observe the patient for four hours, 
if the repeat x-ray shows no reaccumulation of pneumothorax, you pull out the catheter. If the pneumothorax has recurred, you connect it to either a one-way valve or a chest strain. So the management of pneumothorax, if I were to summarize, uh, many of them now can be, I mean, as you can see, can be managed conservatively with simple analgesia and just uh, observation. Uh, if you need to do something, think simple aspiration as the first line. Uh, if, you need to, if you need to connect it to a chest strain, the role of immediate suction is unproven, and that is one of the, res one of the hypotheses behind the increased recurrence rate in the intervention group in the recent paper. All patients should be considered for recurrence prevention because these things do recur. Uh, some advice against flying, you don't want to fly when there's free air in the plural space. Uh, the, this guidance is given based on expert consensus. It's clearly nothing that involves high pressure activities like diving. Uh, and as I said, there's a wide range in the clinical data as to what the rate of recurrence of primary spontaneous pneumothorax is. So when we think about recurrence prevention, we tend to refer patients for recurrence prevention for all these indications. Essentially, anything other than a first episode of primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Right? Um, and in my center, we don't do this under medical thoracoscopy or pleuroscopy. We tend to give this to the surgeons to do under VATS because it is a little bit challenging controlling the analgesia in a very young patient with a normal pleura. It can be quite painful. What the surgeons do, uh, typically bullectomy and pleurodesis. So the pleurodesis with talc is very well established. The bullectomy part is, very, is controversial. So if you do thoracoscopy uh, or uh, VATS, uh, this is what you'll probably see. Uh, and the temptation, of course, if you see blebs and bullet is to clip them off. Uh, the saying, of course, is that the bleb that you can see is the bleb that has not ruptured, right? So this is uh, unproven. And in fact, data suggests that the presence of blebs or the size of blebs do not predict the recurrence rate, right? So, uh, thoracoscopic findings do not help determine who to do the uh, bullectomies on. And as you can see on the picture, this is a patient who has in, inhaled uh, air with, which is labeled with fluorescein, and it seems as if that there seem to be little pores in the pleural surface through which the fluorescein leaks rather than actually a bleb or bullet that has ruptured in many of these patients. So in essence, uh, recurrence prevention the best evidence is for pleurodesis, and we tend to do that with talc. I'll end off with a little bit on persistent air leaks. Um, since this is an interventional uh, uh, conference, uh, this is the grading for, interventional, uh, for air leaks. Um, I'll, again, it's on my slides, uh, and you can download it. Uh, the the procedure, I mean, the way that we treat most of these are through with one-way valves, right? Um, because it's, a, it's an easy way to do it and allows the lung to heal and you don't have to have the patient staying at home. But be careful with them. Um, can, you, can you see the, what has happened to this patient, right? Um, so on the x-ray on the left, the patient has got a right pneumothorax. And then on the x-ray on, uh, on the right, uh, a drain has been put in and can you see what has happened? Right. I know you're not supposed to say tension pneumothorax just based on radiology alone, but this is a sort of film that our radiologists will call us and say, Dave, do you want to do something about this? Okay, this patient, obviously, uh, there is mediastinal shift now, the pneumothorax is bigger, and what has happened is they have placed the hymenic valve the wrong way around. Right? So instead of it being one way out, it was one way in, and it can be very, very dangerous. Right? So be careful where, you know, when untrained staff are, are, are connecting these things to make sure that they put it in the right way. The, my biggest uh, issue with these valves is that they become incompetent when they get wet. And you know, effusions tend to sometimes produce a little bit of serous or uh, discharge. So um, there are newer drains like this which, you know, are not affected by the, by the fluid, and they've got a little chamber where you can collect the fluid, so essentially the patients can still go back. 
Um, some patients cannot tolerate this and you need to fix the problem. Uh, and you, one way of doing that is using a blood patch. Uh, a blood patch is not the same as pleurodesis, right? A blood patch is where you're trying to put uh, blood on the lung to try and form a blood clot over the, the breach in the visceral pleura. Uh, essentially, this is drawing out the patient's own blood in a hep non heparinized syringe. Uh, in, using a three-way uh, tap to inject it through the chest drain and then flush it with air or fluid. Uh, important thing is to the drainage is to be hung at a higher level so as the blood not floating, flowing out. I have the protocol for those of you who are interested in, our sli in my slides if you want to download it. I know I'm running out of time. Uh, and then, of course, I can't not talk about this at an interventional session. Basically, you try and identify the segment of the lung which is affected uh, using a blocker or a Fogarty balloon or you can use the Chartist system. When, the air leak, uh, when you inflate the balloon, if the air leak stops in your chest drain, you know you're in the right segment and then you can place a uh, one-way endobronchial valve. So this is a Zephyr valve. And so that's a one-way valve. And the controversy is really about how long you're going to keep those in place. And I usually tend not to take them out. I let them either fall out or if there's a problem like infection, then go in and fish them out. So my take-home messages is that pneumothorax management is based on clinical symptoms, not size of pneumothorax. You can manage these things conservatively. If drainage is required, think simple aspiration. You don't have to keep uh, put in, I think, large bore chest strains for pneumothorax, you know, and outside the context of something like a ventilated patient is uh, really not used very much anymore. Uh, recurrence cannot be predicted based on thoracoscopic findings, so be circumspect about doing things like pulectomy. Uh, for persistent air leak, uh, my go-to procedure is one-way valves, uh, but if they cannot tolerate that, then you can use either a blood patch or uh, endobronchial valve. Thank you very much.